Man, I feel so sophisticated. Hey, you guys. How you guys doing out there? Uh, yeah, so we're trying something new today. We got the uh, credits going. Isn't that fun? Did you guys have fun with that? I think I did. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that is, a, that is a real thing. That is what we are doing. I feel like we need to uh, have, like, a masterpiece theater sort of... Uh... Well, you know, I put that together a long time ago. Um... And it's been working. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's been that looks working. pretty good. That's yeah. pretty good. So, as I was saying, how you guys doing out there? I am Solar Gray, the cinematic sorcerer. And this is the game gallery. Woo! And I am here today with my very good friend... The Duggernaut! Hey, man. Yep, yeah, so again, that's um, what we are working on is a new thing. You know, I mean, honestly, yeah, I am... I'm a big fan of this. I'm a big fan of that sign right there. Um, but yeah, so, um, man, this stuff has been a journey. I can tell you that. It, it sure has, like a literal journey. Yeah, and, you yeah know. A, a literal journey has been done. <laughs> um, for those of you guys on SoundCloud and on the YouTubes and all that stuff, we're going to we're gonna do something a little bit different. But, and this is, this is going to be the real thing, um, we're going to have a little bit of a problem with the frame up and a little bit of a problem with switching back and forth because our switcher isn't exactly fast. So <laughs> if things like slow down, it's a bit of a lag, but you know, um, a wise person once told me that there is a triad of production, good, fast, and cheap. You can have two. Well, we're doing we're doing fast pretty well, and uh, I think we're doing we're doing cheap. So a little bit of quality hits to be under, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean it, it's one of those things. And but. and honestly, a little bit of a slowdown on the switching. Yeah, it's, it's not the worst. Well, it it tends to mean that um, how can I put this? We have to listen to what each other has to say. Oh, I, I don't know. That's a real thing. That's a real thing. Uh, you're you're uh, putting a lot on me today, but I'll see what I can do. So, man, um, how was your week? How was your week? Pretty good. I uh, spent most of it in Austin, Texas for a work conference. Uh, a lot of cool things in Austin. I didn't get to see any of them. Um, no, that's not true. I did swing by Dragon's Lair briefly, uh, which is, uh, for anybody who's never been to Austin, a really fantastic game store. Um, they've got pretty much everything, um, and they've got great play space and all kinds of other cool stuff. But I uh, didn't get to spend a lot of time there, just... Swung by, my friend who was picking me up to take me to the airport was like, oh, let's get beers and go to Dragon's Lair. And I'm like, well, twist my arm, why don't you? <laughs> uh, so it was it was a good time. Um, but yeah, the the rest of the week, um, last weekend I actually had a chance to play some Frostgrave, uh, which was very fun. And other than that, it's mostly been painting and uh, you know playing some video games and you know, just trying to, trying to keep myself busy. How about you? Um, well, honestly, um, I'll check this stuff out. Um, yeah, honestly, um, I'm jealous that you got to go to Austin, actually. Super, yeah. Super jelly, super jelly. <laughs> um, because I wanted to say, hey, that's right. Um, um, I've got my head turned away from you because I just, I, I, I give up on you. I quit. I quit. I turn I mean, my back on you. I, I understand. No, um, actually, no, I wanted to, um say hey because you were in austin and i am jealous because that is such a gamer town it really is i, mean, I didn't understand it until i i went there you at your recommendation actually mm -hmm. you you said to go to dragon's lair and i was like oh how good can it be no it, it was it was fantastic and you've told me there's a number of other stores i haven't even been to yet yeah and you're messing it up already your excitement is just making it so hard for me to switch my apologies. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I mean, it, it really is um, a friendly gaming town. One of the people that um, I'm a big fan of is mm -hmm. um, there's one particular store on Palmer Avenue called, um, well, it's called Mothership um, Comics. Mm. So if you want to check this thing out here, yeah, Mothership Comics and Games. And the owner is a wonderful young woman. Um, and it's half gaming store half um cyber cafe hmm. and um yeah the website is here we'll post a link to it but yeah mothership books and games in austin and they have loads of events loads of um 
loads of um, games, and again, since half of it's a cyber cafe, uh-huh. you can get your Fallout on. <laughs> and while you're waiting for your friends to show up to run, or yeah. if you show up early and you're waiting for the DM, you can get your Fallout on. You can get your um, your what was the other stuff? You know those, those other <laughs> bleep bleep bibbity beep games that people do out there. So yeah, <laughs> Mothership Games is is a really really good place. I got an interview with her when I was there. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, yeah, yeah it's it's on my list the next time I'm able to, to sneak out there to, to check out Mothership. And uh, you'd mentioned a couple others, and I'll, I'll get a complete list from you next time. But, uh, yeah, it, the fact that Austin is such a cool gaming town. Ah! Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we had a thing. I oh, okay. I turn off the notifications on, on the Facebook some, or on the computer sometimes. Hmm. Keep going. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was just saying, um... That the the fact that Austin is such a such an exciting gaming town is actually something I wouldn't have expected. Um, you know, everybody says it's kind of Southern California, but Texas, and Southern California's got an okay gaming community. But what I didn't take into account is that I've heard that the Midwest has a really strong gaming community for especially miniatures games, and uh, so being able to see that that mix of you know, the, the Southern California sort of culture with this, like, really intense Midwest, like, serious gaming, you know, war gaming, miniatures gaming, uh, you know, role-playing games, all that stuff. Um, they really have, they, they've really kind of hit the nail on the head with, with a really cool um, culture they're developing there. So I'm pretty excited by that. Yeah, as, as am I, as am I, like, seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, speaking of games, we've got some stuff. Hang on. Uh, say cheese. Yeah, speaking of games, we got um, some good stuff that's coming down. Um, it's, um, man, my week has been crazy, mm-hmm. just crazy. Um, my mentors came in town, and mm. um, I, man, you know, when the teacher comes into town, a weird thing <laughs> is, um, for those of you guys out there that talk to us regularly over here back in the deck, we are just all over, not on the coattails, and we're not dick riding, we're just trying to learn as much as we can from the people that do this. So mm-hmm. we're big fans of the Cinema Snob, really big fans of Seth Sarkowski, if you're out there listening, dude, thank yeah. you. And um, a really big fan of DoubleToasted.com. And a lot of people were in town this week for VidCon, the YouTube convention. Mm. So pretty much all the YouTubers were in all of the were in all of the places in your neck of the woods in Orange County. Yeah, I'm I'm a little disappointed I was out of town for it. Well, you know, it's funny because you were in Austin and Double Toasted from <laughs> Austin was here. And um, I had such a moment. Now, when you're friends with a comedian, mm-hmm. the number one thing you got to make clear is you know that you are going to end up being a story in yeah. the act. Oh, yeah. So you have to, much like asserting your rights with cops. Yeah, I know. We got the yellow box. I'm sorry. (laughs) Um, You have to, have to, have to, always have to assert this will not be a routine. So it's like, oh, yeah, blah, 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 talk, talk, talk. No, I don't want that to be a routine. I don't want that to be a routine. I know know some Hmm. routines. And and using that, you got to be responsible because you know they're going to say something. They're going to say something. Sure. You know, it's just you got to be real careful about what you what you what you don't say. You don't want them to say because if they don't know, it's going up there. And um, so I feel like that would be just a bonus perk of being friends with a comedian is knowing that you're going to be part of their uh, their shtick. Um, no, no, that's no. not that's not how that works. No, it's not how it works. No. I've I've never been friends with someone who does stand up comedy, so I yeah, I, you have. well. Let me, let me rephrase that. I promise that. a lot of the world knows your business. They just don't know what yours. Fair enough. You know, I know how much I've said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Actually, I'm not. I've said a lot of shit about this guy, or a lot of stuff about this guy. Yeah, that's um, fair. i got a lot of stuff worth talking about. Now. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'm trying to do is I'm trying to keep, um, I'm trying to change my speaking habits. Okay. Because, um... Again, I've cursed like a sailor since I was in eighth grade, mm-hmm. but I'm doing a lot of stuff that's more kid friendly. Mm. So now I'm trying to keep this down on the on the PG thirteen. That, that makes thing, sense, you know. And um, it's hard. 
Yeah, man. Now that I've got a, a daughter of my own, um, <laughs> I, I find myself trying to police my language a little better and failing pretty badly most of the time. But um, I, I certainly understand that drive. To be like, you know, I should try to clean up my language, clean up my act. You know, be be a little less making dick jokes all the time. And uh, you know, the, the problem with trying to stop making dick jokes is that it's hard. It's just so hard. Not falling for that. Ah. I'm, I'm not going. I'm not going to do that. You're not going to get me. I mean, like I got to also work on getting my dad jokes up to par, you know, mm. and uh, finding the balance between a a lame body joke and a dad joke is often a, a finer line than I gave it credit for. Uh, I will. I will say that. Yeah. So hopefully we're still live right now. I'm not quite sure. Oh. Um, okay. That yeah, would be I mean, good to know. The whole thing is saying, yeah, no, you're totally streaming, man. You're totally streaming. Should I try to look it up on my end, too? Yeah, I would say so. Okay. Say yeah, we'll see what there. I can do on here. Um, oh, wait. I have a forward button here. Mm-hmm. Nope. Mm-hmm. Let's yeah, see. Yeah, um, you know, it was like, oh, I'm coming in live and clear. Um, funny thing. No, I've got... S- oh. Yeah, yeah, that's... That. Oh, it only recorded it for, like, 12 seconds. Oh. Well, it still says I'm streaming, but it says I can't, I'm not recording, so let's hope this is working. I mean, I literally logged into the live stream link, and it didn't. Hmm. All right, well, um, we're just taking a look, making sure that everything is coming out. Because it says, hey, we're live now, well, and there are three um, people. We're just taking a look. Oh, we're on YouTube, though. Coming out. Shh. It says, hey. Yeah, yeah, no, we're still doing it. We're still oh, we're on YouTube, it. though. Oh, okay. No! No! Silence my mouth! Yeah, yeah, no, oh. I cannot believe that this whole time no. I've been talking out of your mic. No. You've been talking out of my mic? Yeah, oh. I, yeah, my mic wasn't on. I cannot on. believe oh, that geez. this whole time I've been talking out of your mic. You've been talking out of my mic? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah, my mic wasn't on. I cannot on. believe oh, that geez. this whole time I've been talking out of your mic. Yeah, so Let's that's see. a real thing. Uh, oh, yep. And uh, my friends have commented that the link on the back of the deck page is not working. You were talking out of my mic, and uh, I sound great. Uh, so, yeah, I think we're we're getting it worked out here. Well, thank you, YouTube commenters. Yeah. Oh, and also they can't comment on YouTube. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, no, they can't. Not right now. <laughs> um, there's right. only so much I can do. Um, that's fair. Again, one of the things that I've seriously been working on is getting this stuff up, but it's really, really difficult. The more you try and do the live streaming, Mm -hmm. the more the stuff goes, hey, this is great, but you've got the wrong equipment. Spend another 300 bucks. Mm. And then there's this, spend another 400 bucks. And then there's this, and spend another 500 bucks. And um, well, I've been I've been consistently impressed with your ability to make an amazing finished product out of the you know on, on that little triangle uh, on the mm. cheap side. Oh my God! And well, you know, being broke helps. Yeah. Well, on that good, fast, cheap, you you went for good and cheap, and it takes a while, but you make a fantastic product. So this is definitely outside your wheelhouse from what you've normally been doing. And I gotta say, I'm I'm pretty impressed with the setup so far. Um, so all that being said, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you're doing right now. Well, you? now at the moment, I'm, um, I'm actually going to go get a monitor for the YouTube things. Ah, yeah. So that um, would be good. <clears throat> so yeah, with that, I would like put a little dance animation up there and all that <laughs> no, stuff, no, 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 but no, no. I'm not the monkey to dance. You are. Hey, that's what you're paying me the big bucks for, right? Yeah. The entire big dollar. All right. Well, hello YouTube. I'm so glad that you were able to join me today. As it turns out, uh, I am now apparently alone in this room and can say whatever I want on this stream. But I didn't prepare for this at all, so I don't really know what I can say. Ah, he's back. (laughs) Ah, well. Um, Yeah, uh, I I guess I'm just vamping for a few minutes. Um, I will kind of start off. uh, We're going to talk about Frostgrave a little bit later, um, but I'll kind of give a prelude to that in that I'm very excited about this game right now. Uh, I love the... um, I love the the small scale skirmish sort of games. So anything that's going to be like Frostgrave, this is not a test. Uh, new one that I'm looking at called Zone Raiders. 
Um, these games where your entire army that you're bringing to the table is, you know, eight to ten miniatures or so, uh, and they're often model agnostic, which means that you can just pick up, you know, in my case, whatever Reaper bones I could find around, uh, old miniatures I'd gotten from friends, stuff that I have no idea what games it came from. I've got a friend who's using old Malifaux miniatures. Um, but if you're buying Reaper bones miniatures, which are uh, soft plastic, very cheap miniatures, um, you can probably get an entire game's worth of miniatures for 20 bucks, and you can get uh, the rule book for about 25 and suddenly you've got a, a full game ready to play. And then there were the folks that love ordering um, second, um, second thing, you know, second hand. Well, so, yes. yes. And, yeah, so, hi, people. Sorry about the commenting on all that stuff. Um, if you were trying to watch this on the, um, on the website, we're working on that, too. My tech is really, really busy with this god person. Um, <laughs> but um, hit us up on the Back in the Deck YouTube. Just look at the Back in the Deck YouTube. Uh, the Duggernaut's going to be tweeting that out there. But, yeah, and we are going to be talking about Frostgrave because model agnostic. I love. It's a thing. Love model agnostic. Because I got so tired of buying X amount of miniatures mm -hmm. for X game at X time. And then when people were like, I don't want to play that X game right now. I'm playing a different thing. I'm like, well, what did I spend all this money and these hours and hours yep. and hours and hours and hours and hours learning how to paint for? Like, why was I doing that? You know? So <clears throat> let me see if I can get a little more centered here yes i'm in the center center of the game or actually center of the thing but yeah and <clears throat> man i was so mad so mad for so long about that very thing um because well how can i put this i ain't got that much money i really <laughs> don't i don't have that much money and everything i do i I essentially live off of magic. That's the part of wizardry that I chose. Not the game, mind you. No, 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 no. Not the game. Not Magic the Gathering. I pretty much live off of magic. So having all that money to spend disposably and then have my friends go, yeah, we're going to play this new game now. I'm like, well, thank you. Thank you very much. We're no longer friends. I don't want to talk to you anymore. So then came Frostgrave, and this is not a test. Um, we talked about... Um, we talked about um, model agnostic games. That's going up on SoundCloud eventually. But Frostgrave is the fantasy one. And the fantasy um, game based on if you got a bunch of miniatures, use them. You Not don't even have to use bunch. our stuff. Hmm? Not even a bunch. That's what's exciting about it. Like, Well, go on. Well, yeah. I mean, like I said, the, the size of the game is... You know, the maximum size that you can bring if you bring the the most possible dudes into your warband is 10 dudes. 10 right? dudes. 10 dudes. Okay. Uh, you, you might be able to get 11 with certain magic spells, but, like, that's like if you have 10 dudes and a zombie sort of thing. Um, so you're looking at, realistically, 8 to 10 models, and those models can be from literally anything. I've got some converted models I did a while ago from role-playing games. I've got some Reaper Bones models, which as I mentioned are like cheap soft plastic models. Um, you can use models from any game. Uh, if you have a war game army or part of an army or something from, like I say, my friends using Malifaux stuff, they, you know, even though it's a fantasy game and they, you know, Malifaux stuff has a lot of guns and all that, that's fine. We just call those guns crossbows and move forward. Yeah, and that is, that is a huge thing. Now there's a lot to mm -hmm. say about feel but um sure. now we got um frostgrave like right here if um you haven't like checked that out i think you should um yeah there we go there <laughs> we go i'm learning but um yeah if um if you're really one for fantasy um historical recreation and things like that it's a thing it's a thing um I've never really... Okay, I can't say I've never. There was a time where I was seriously, seriously into fantasy. But fantasy as a genre, especially in this very niche market, has what I call a Decker problem. A um, Decker problem. Yes, a Decker problem. And the Decker problem is very simple. Um, most of the Deckers are people of color, women, LGBT, 
and the disabled. So when you're having these games in the in the middle of this medieval Europe setting, when you end up playing with your friends that let's call them melanin deficient, they tend to or, go or melanin over uh hmm? Or, or they have more melanin than the characters in Frostgrave. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm just saying if they, if they have less, mm. when it comes to playing fantasy, they go in with that baggage. Oh, okay. Like, you know, well, if this game were real, you would, you know, oh. they, they wouldn't say you would be. Yeah. But there's always that undertone. Okay. Um, so I was really reticent about doing the Frostgrave thing um, because I was a little bit tired of fantasy and here because of all my white friends. I mean that that's really what it came down yeah, to. Yeah, I can see that if that's your experience. Um now I know last time we recorded we talked about okay, well, I don't like um post apocalypse because it's my childhood yes. and I don't like I, I I don't like fantasy because there's not enough African um African representation. Mhm. Um, and because, you know, my white friends really have that, well, there were really no black people in this, uh, blah, 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 you know, so it's like, what games do I like? The answer is future. Mm -hmm. Future cyber fiction, like future dystopia, I dig. Mm -hmm. Um, game, there, there is a game called Numenera that is like heard of that. two billion years from today. Ooh, neat. Epochs have come and gone yeah. and your cell phone and my cell phone our magical items for our characters to find type thing like modern mm. technology from today has been imbued with magic but you mm. know that's a thing but i gave as i said for uh grave a bit of a shot and i was surprised at how much fun i had mm -hmm. you know i just i i pulled out the basic thing and um yeah with that i was just kind of going you know this is not a bad game i wasn't used to the d20 aspect I that one takes a little bit of getting one. used to. But yeah, just with the Frostgrave thing, you know, I, I really wasn't wasn't cool with it, you know, mm -hmm. or not cool, just used to it. Yeah. Well, what I like about Frostgrave, the while the models themselves are model agnostic, the setting is also very setting agnostic. I mean, the the pitch for the game in terms of the the setup for it is that you know a thousand years ago there was the city full of wizards that was super powerful they had all the wizard magic everything was great and they did something some horrible thing happened and a spell got cast the city was put into a thousand year winter everything was frozen hmm. and now it's a thousand years later magic is largely gone from the world and wizards are rare and and they fight very hard to try and get more magic whenever they can or more knowledge so wizards from all over the world have heard that this, this ancient city is starting to thaw and the edges of it are slowly becoming available and little bits of magic and, and uh, magical items and treasure and things the like that. Bits, the, bits. the bits. So wizards from all over the world of every magical tradition start showing up and so that's part of why your model agnostic warband can look like whatever the hell you want. Uh, if you want to have literally anything from traditional Tolkien looking Gandalf and the Fellowship show up to the most wild uh, steampunk or cyberpunk or whatever you can probably justify it as yeah you know the people from this area they gotta <laughs> they, they I don't know um, but you can you can make it work with almost any sort of thing that you want um, it's definitely, the rules are based around fantasy, but like mm -hmm. I said, if you're willing to hand wave some stuff like, uh, guns have crossbow rules, then you're pretty much good to go. Well, one of the things I figured about Frostgrave in and of itself is, <clears throat> how can I put this? I say that a lot. Um, <laughs> since the setting is so open, mm -hmm. or more to the point, since the rule book is so thin, yeah it is oh, like it's it. like look we just have the game mechanics yep now play the game um writing your own setting is a really big thing yes and that's one of the things that i wanted to honestly um address um as far as frostgrave goes since the game mechanics are so there mm -hmm. um it is easy to say okay i'm gonna play me some frostgrave mm -hmm. i'm gonna use this engine as it were yeah but I'm going to skin this thing with something other than that. Or mm -hmm. I'm going to incorporate something into this game that I want there. Like in my case, 
um, other countries that haven't been written for the game yet that aren't Europe 1102. Yeah. You know? I would um, love to see more of that. Yeah, I, I would too. I, I've been on this thing that's like, um, I love ancient Asia. I've been mm-hmm. studying a lot of Chinese history nice. lately because, I don't know, like I need something to watch on YouTube as I'm going to sleep and I'm getting tired of people of watching Fallout playthroughs. <laughs> um, and... I took a look at Frostgrave, and I'm like, okay, this is a world I can deal with. Yeah. Uh, the D20 mechanic, like I said, a little weird, a little weird, but, yeah. you know, thanks, Stickman. He he um, helped me through it. And then at the end of everything, like after all was said and done, um, after all was said and done, I found this weird thing of I'm having fun. Yeah. And it was, I was having so much fun, as a matter of fact, um, that someone gave me the first expansion to Frostgrave. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and um, it's very swampy. Oh, yeah? It's a swamp thing with all, all that other stuff. Is that so, the the archipelago one? or? Um, well, I'll, I'll pull it up in, in just a few minutes. Okay. But yeah, so um, who were you playing with? I was playing with my friend Pat, um, okay. who uh, is a good friend of mine. Um, he also shares your general dislike of post-apocalypse. Well, well let, let, like, again, we're talking about Frostgrave people. In case you guys, um, in case you guys are just tuning in, we're mm-hmm. talking about Frostgrave, and Doug played his first game last yeah. week. So, um, I think it was technically my second one. My first one was years ago, and I didn't know what I was doing. Okay. So this one, I still didn't know what I was doing, but I was more interested in investing in it in, mentally. Um, so. Uh, yeah, it, it was um, it was very enjoyable. Uh, it definitely had some ups and downs to the game itself. Where um, the how do I put this? Uh, some of the spells are not super balanced around a super perfect balanced playthrough, and that's okay. They're not supposed to be. You're a wizard. Sometimes wizards have super powerful magic. Sometimes it's more subtle. Um, so my buddy Pat, when he was playing, had a wizard who could literally mind control other models. And this game ended up being, you know, you talked about the D20 system and how sometimes it, it's a little bit wonky. Um, as, as happened in this case, uh, he rolled a natural 20 on a 20-sided die, which meant that basically I couldn't break the mind control on uh, the model that he took, which was one of my best models. Uh, and so suddenly the game took a severe turn against me and it ended up being a very close game, but I, I killed the wizard who was, uh, mind controlling the guy, got the guy back, you know, ended up, uh, doing great, stealing a lot of treasure and ended up winning. And I had realized before the, you know, the big change at the end of the game, um, I realized that even if I lost at that point, I was going to be enjoying the hell out of this game. It was just cool. There were dudes running through ruins, grabbing treasure, wizards casting spells, um, you know, people getting mind controlled, crossbow bolts flying, uh, barbarians charging with all kinds of magic, powering them up. It was just cool. <laughs> and I was just enjoying the game. Even if I had lost horribly, if I got all my dudes mind controlled and, and you know, had to just grab my ankles and take it. Uh, it was, Damn, it was, dude. Hey, <laughs> I mean, it, it was feeling like that near the end of the game, but uh, it was just fun. And like you said, the, it's this kind of weird thing where you play this game and, and you come out of it and you go, huh, that was just enjoyable. I get that. Yeah. I totally get that. And to answer your question, yes, the second one was called Ghost Archipelago. And yes, the the phrase is Archipelago. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Oh, well, was... not with that stupid accent. But well, yeah. Archipelago? Yeah, Archipelago. I was wondering about that. I was, um, you know, one of those words I read. And it's never... the definition. Well, it's its definition, again, is, um, well, with archipelago the definition is a series of islands yeah so hawaii jamaica you know those are that is technically that entire thing is called an archipelago um i you know but again with with this one um it's pirates nice i'm like damn it damn it i'm not a big pirate fan Mm. um because i'm a middle-aged man well, also, you, uh, you, you've talked about stuff like Seventh Sea and how yeah, it, yeah. pirate media, like pirates themselves, okay, you know, say what you will about them, but uh, the, the way pirate media is portrayed um, 
seems to be, uh, as, as you were putting it earlier, less Decker friendly? Um, well, it's not even a matter of the Decker friendly aspect. It's really more um, um, the aspect of these guys are rapists, killers, yeah. and thieves. I don't exactly want to. Um, I, I don't want to glorify that. Really. Yeah, that's that's where I'm coming down on that. I'm trying to get more centered in frame. As well, so I'm just <laughs> like, yeah. Um, I'll have you move the camera um, if we pull up a clip of something. But okay. Um, but again, that's just me being all crotchety and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm I'm trying not to be. See if you could uh, move my camera over just a little. Just pan me, pan me. Pan me, pan me. Hello. Yeah, there we go. Like yeah, it? That's a lot better. All right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, uh, as I was saying, um, again, this is our first live stream, so bear with us, okay? <laughs> I just got all the gear up, and it's killing me, Damn. strumming my pain with my fingers, type killing me. Um, but again, when it comes to to rule books, I mean, this is. This is Ghost Archipelago, yeah. right here. The, the entire expansion, the, which all of it. This is the whole expansion, which is a little bit more game mechanics and a little bit more fluff, right here. And that's um, about the same size as the core book. Yeah, I, I actually I think it's about five pages bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the core book doesn't have that much. So, once a person has learned the rules, and mm. this is important, especially to our new guys out there, when you learn the rules to a system. If you're not liking the the fiction that goes with it, what mm -hmm. we call the fluff, you can use that system in your own little setting. There's tons Absolutely. and tons of resources out there mm -hmm. for just that. Um, again, I I learned this with um the old White Wolf stuff, the old yeah. White Wolf stuff because I love I loved World of Darkness 2.0, but mm -hmm. I hated the fluff. I really? hated the cultures, huh. um, but I like the old game mechanics. Yeah. So I'm like, maybe I can play the old cultures with new... It took a little rigging. But, um, but yeah, so all in all, Frostgrave, would you recommend people play it? Absolutely. Um, it's it's absolutely worth um, picking up... You know, Like I say, the, the entry cost is low. The potential for fun is high. Um, for literally, um, if you have... If you already play any miniatures game at all, you have miniatures to play Frostgrave. If you don't, you're not looking at a huge investment of miniatures, uh, money-wise or literal model-wise, um, which means that it's going to be less to deal with, less to store, less to paint, all right. of that. Um, as you mentioned, the the fluff can be pretty much whatever you want. The, the default is there's a frozen city that's slowly thawing. It's full of monsters, and we're stealing treasure out of it. You could kind of, if you wanted to reskin the mechanics to be pretty much anything you wanted, you could have fantasy zombie apocalypse going on. You could have uh, all kinds of stories that uh, involve giants and monsters and fantastical things. You could, ha you could probably recreate uh, large sections of Lord of the Rings playing through this game. Um, but realistically this game is just going to be whatever you want it to be and that's part of why i like it so much um it has a campaign system built into it so that every game you play if you want to with your friends can connect to the next one your wizard is going to level up over time you're going to get more powerful more treasure better guys in your party uh build a base of operations and start to research magical formulas there um so the, the game can be anything from a long-running campaign you play with your friends to some one-off fun when you just have a few miniatures and a couple hours on a Saturday. So it's uh, highly recommended by me. Um, awesome. I, think it's, I think it's the best of the skirmish games I've played so far. Better than TNT. Nice. Well, let me... And again, I'm showing... Again, that would be um, Ghost Archipelago for some people. Hey, hey I, I didn't know. know how it was pronounced. Yeah, um... Now someone in the um in the in the YouTube chat was like, I have always heard it spelled archipelago. And I'm like, well, archipelago or <laughs> archipelago or whatever. But yeah, we're um I'm just putting I'm putting up our link right now on Deckers on the book. Just so that the people in um people in God knows where 
actually know that we're transmitting. So that's a fun thing to do. Yeah, I already tweeted the the YouTube link. So we'll do it again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, so that's a thing. That is really a thing. Um, ooh, look at all that. Yeah, they're like, ooh, I get to do all that jazz. And, you know, Facebook is becoming so weird. It's asking, it's asking for so many things. And, yeah, I know my voice is nasally. But interesting thing, um, as we move on to the next little bit today, um, I got to teach someone how to play hero clicks Ooh. for a hot moment. Um, and one of the things that I found in teaching someone how to play hero clicks is I was reminded of something that I'd forgotten about. Um, I am I'm an old school gamer. I'm old. I'm like, oh man, I've been gaming for 20 something years. I look up and I'm like, how did that happen? <laughs> you know, seriously, how did I end up um how did I end up gaming for this long? And with that, there is what experts call unconscious competence. Okay. Which means what's easy for some people after years and years of practice ain't easy for everybody. Hmm. You know, it really isn't. That makes sense. And um, so I'm like, okay, well, hey, if this stuff isn't easy for other people, I'll live with that. I'll accept that. And, um, but how do I make it easier? Yeah. Okay. Easier is the whole thing. So I taught this guy um, how to play, how to play clicks and... I noticed something, and mm -hmm. this is one of the things <clears throat> that I want to bring up. Um, I could tell the entire story of all this stuff, but let's just say um, the game consisted of me using a member of the Fantastic Four. I think it was Johnny Storm. Um, you know, my Hobbit, the little vixen, is um, is using Captain Kirk mm -hmm. from the Star Trek set. And he's, he plays very much like, we come in peace, shoot to kill, shoot to kill. Um, <laughs> that, that's really what he does. And this guy decided to use the Hulk um, from the Th Mighty Thor starter kit. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to use Deadpool. And I'm like, Argh. but um, we played the game and this, is, this Hulk is one of the easiest ones I've ever seen used. Mm -hmm. Essentially... He gets a free attack against everyone he's adjacent to every time he moves. He moves, he smashes. He Hulk moves smash. again, he smashes. Hulk smash. um, nothing stops this guy's movement. Nothing. He jumps over everything. He breaks stuff. Nothing. He even breaks away from people with no attacks of opportunity, nor does he have to, or nor can anyone hold him down. Mm -hmm. So he's literally just running around, quaking, running around, quaking. Ah, Hulk smash. Okay, and... As I was teaching the guy, he kept asking a lot of questions that a lot of new gamers do, which is, he's asking what he should do, but what he means is, what do I have to do to not lose? Okay. Not how do I play the game, how do I win? Mm. Okay? Um, because there's this fear of, of losing, like, I lost at this game, therefore my identity is in pain or something and it seems like what is it this 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 merging of embarrassment and um and the lack of victory hmm. and it's like in every game someone has to lose but people are fighting to not be embarrassed and i'm like whoa you're new mm -hmm. you just learn you you are learning yeah like you just learned that this game exists and you're trying to be expert at it on your first time. And if not, you, you're you sounding like you're going to be embarrassed or something. And I never had that problem because I look at everything, every single thing as a skill set, including live casting. Huh? You see what I did there? It's a skill you're learning. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, it's a, Since everything is a skill set, it requires knowledge and um, practice. And you're going to make mistakes. You're going to iron things out. And I go into teaching the game, understand, understanding this. But most of the people I teach games to are like, well, I don't know what to do because they don't want to lose. I don't want to lose. Oh, my God. If I lose, no, no. Um, and I'm like, guys, winning or losing isn't as important as learning. Yeah. You know, losing Especially on the is first not couple learning. Games. Yeah. 
And um, hang on, let me see if I can get you in frame here. Oh, look at that, yeah. You know, so what are your thoughts on that? Because I know you're a very competitive person. Uh, less now than I was, but um, there's absolutely that mindset that um, if you're if you're not optimizing your game, whether it's your list building or your uh, your strategies, your combinations of skills, spells, abilities, whatever it is, if you're not playing the best that it is possible to play, not the best you can play, the best that it is possible to play, you are somehow failing. Um, and there's podcasts you can listen to for untold hours of people talking about strategies to, you know, pick a game. It doesn't even matter which game we're talking about. But, um, you know, strategies that could be, uh, you know, how to win tournaments, how to, uh, you know, how to basically break the game in your favor. And people get really, really deep into thinking about stuff like this. And I think that it ends up being really poisonous, especially to new players, because if that's the mentality that everyone's going into it with is like every seasoned player is coming in saying, how do I just dominate this game and that's what a new player faces from everyone who has any experience in the game right out the gate then their experience is only going to be well i got uh i got my shit pushed in pardon my french there uh and it's going to keep happening until i either shape up to their standards or quit and there's no thought of like well how do you just play the game to have fun how do you just learn how to do the thing um, and trying to find a group of people that is okay with just playing the game for fun is getting harder and harder, it seems. And a game like Frostgrave kind of, because of the inherent, weird, unbalanced nature of magic in the game, it's hard to make that perfectly optimized list. And I think that is to the game's credit, because it means that a new player can sit down and just learn to play the game and just have fun doing it. Hero clicks, likewise, with a million combinations of a <laughs> million characters that, for whatever reason, have all found themselves on this game board playing together, it's not going to be balanced. And if you're trying to make this perfect, optimized list, you're not really going to be having fun. And you, you could do it if you spend enough money and enough time learning all the combinations of hero clicks and how exactly to make them all work. Yeah, you can, you can go from being someone who just started the game to someone who is dominating people who are veterans in no time flat. But are you even learning to play the game or are you just learning how to push the the win button repeatedly, <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, honestly, um, when it came down to that, it, it's, it's that question like, okay, I like thinking things all the way through, all the way through. Um, and when I say that, I mean, um, how can I put this bluntly? Um, you know, again, I'm really trying to learn how to do this without cursing. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, hey, I want kids to watch this. I'm trying to get yeah. to the junior high school guys. Um, the truth is, the idea of wanting to win is fine. Um Oh, by the way, you guys um in the YouTube chat, I know, I know there's the facial recognition thing. I'm looking to fix that, but it was either get everything perfect or not transmit, you know. So I chose, I chose giving you guys the best that we had. Um, but as I was saying, the idea of playing to win is fine. You know, it's fine. Um, wanting to win is very important. But that's only a surface thought. It's only a tiny, tiny thought on the surface because you can't win at something you don't know about. Yeah. You know, you can get lucky. You can get lucky. Mm -hmm. But a real victory, actually using your skills and understanding of the thing that you're playing. Mm -hmm. You know, as much as I want to win at basketball, I don't know any plays. <laughs> you know, I don't. Yeah. I, I, I don't know a pick and roll. I don't know. Like, I know names of stuff. Yeah. But I don't know what goes into them. So when I get a bat, you know, when I get on the court, this is why I'm a Saturday morning gamer. Because when I get on the court, I'm just looking to do the best I can with as much as I know. And if I win or lose, I win or lose. But yeah. I did my best and I had fun doing it. 
But a lot of people only define fun by victory. Yeah. And I'm like, well, if losing is embarrassment, I can understand where you're coming from from that. But let's think the thought all the way through. Mm -hmm. If losing is terrible and you're embarrassed by doing so, why are you trying to inflict it on another person? Yeah. (laughs) You know, why why do you want to be that guy? Yeah. Why do you want to make someone else feel the way that you don't want to feel? You know, there's got to be a different purpose, you know? So, um, so yeah, I think, uh, someone coined the term decoupling loss from embarrassment because you're not going to win every time, you know, the dice roll funny for everybody. And, um, quite honestly, woo, um, not quite honestly, you're going to get better. Um, and you, you go as far as you want to go. And that's, that's in direct response to all those dudes out there that are like, get good. Or <laughs> I learned, I, I got my butt kicked all the time when I was first learning the game. Therefore and, I must inflict it on you. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, I don't want to be King crap, a turd mountain. <laughs> I really don't. Nor, do, nor am I waiting for my turn to be a jerk. When I have the power, I try not to not to inflict it on someone else. Yeah. Well, I wanted to uh, respond to something in the YouTube chat here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the question was, um, if veterans are constantly learning all the new stuff, how are new players ever going to catch up? Ah, yes, that's coming in from um, clever little vixen. Mm-hmm. I was, I, you know, I was going to do that segment at, uh, later on in the show. Well, I mean, but, it's. Yeah. I, I don't well, know that I have the perfect answer. Oh, for don't worry it, about it. Let, I, let's let's get it done. They want to know. We are going <laughs> to answer those questions. Well, I was just going to give some some anecdotal uh, bit. You know, for me, when I started uh, my first war game, which was War Machine, um, back Woo, in... Yeah. Privateer! <laughs> um, way, way back in uh, 2007, long after you started. But um, <laughs> uh, when I started playing that game, um, I was playing probably one to two times per week, mm-hmm. um, which, ah, oh, those Halcyon days. Right. Um, I was working at a game store. I got to play every day. <sighs> okay, I got to give demos every day. Well. Still, you're you're you know as you would put it, putting the rock in the hole. Yeah, and uh, exactly. You know, you're you're doing the thing, you're having fun. But I was playing War Machine, and I was playing a couple of times a week, and I was losing every single time for months. And a veteran, uh, like I, uh, to to address the question more directly, the veterans are always learning more. They're getting more experience. They're getting, you know, more of everything else. The new player has well. I bought a few models, and this is all I could afford right now. How am I supposed to compete with you? And it involved a lot of losing at first and getting really disheartened, and that was not fun. And the veteran crowd that I was encountering was, to put it mildly, not welcoming of new players. There was no like, hey, let me sit down with you and talk to you about your list. Let me talk to you about how you're playing the game and how to be better and how to win games or how More to have to fun doing it. How you're playing wrong and if you're having fun, you're still doing it wrong. Whatever, the, however you want to frame it. The idea was the veterans, <laughs> the veterans were not even engaging the new players. And that sucked. That sucked real bad as a new player because I didn't even have the chance to talk to people and they wouldn't let me into their little clique and, you know, teach me their veteran ways or anything. But over time, I figured out, okay, I found one little thing that works. They can, you know, it's a gotcha moment once in a while and then I can use that and expand it to do another thing. And eventually I got good enough that I was doing tournaments and feeling reasonably confident in my skills at the game. Um, But... Ultimately, it ended up being me playing this game with the veterans and not really knowing how to play the game or even how to have fun playing it because I had to go from, well, I have a few models and I'm figuring out how to play the game to how do I find any win button in this (laughs) game? And then I'm just going to keep mashing that button repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really learn the underlying reason for playing the game or how to have fun playing it or a lot of that stuff. And that wasn't until years later that I was able to step back and go, oh, I can actually just play this game and have fun and it's okay if i lose and here you know here's some ways for me to do it so to once again loop back around to the question of how do new players catch up the veterans have to take a stronger stand in that they have to be willing to engage new players and say hey 
uh, I see that you know you only have these few models. <clears throat> you know, let's talk about how you can have fun playing them. If you want to win, let's talk about some strategies that are the best way to use exactly what you have, um, or with you know minimal further expansion into the game, and how to do well. Not necessarily win, but do well with what you have. And conversations like that allow new players to engage with the idea that they can just play the game to have fun. They can still do well. They can still learn new strategies. They can learn from these veteran players who are generally constantly learning more, uh, getting more, um, you know, getting more experience, getting more knowledge, getting all the expansions, and in some cases, getting every model the company produces. Um, and the new players can't keep up on that level, but they can learn from them, and the veterans can make room in their little clique for the new players. And I think that's going to be the biggest change to help uh, new players start catching up and having fun with the game. I am, I am, oh, I'm really glad, really glad that you brought that up because, um, honestly, um, the difference between a well, the difference between <clears throat> someone who's playing to have fun and someone who's trying to teach someone to play to win is astronomical. We can do whole shows on that, and we will. Okay. Um, now, there's a dude, I think he's one of yours, a uh, Rick Hardslab. Yeah, that's a uh, good old Rick Hardslab. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, well, at least his name lets me know what he does for a living. Now, um... What, there's nothing wrong with being a corner. Anyway, yeah. um, this guy is saying um, loss of embarrassment isn't the best approach. But decoupling Instead, loss from embarrassment. Yeah, um, but decoupling winning from having fun. I like the idea. I really like the idea. But there is a primal thing there. There is a natural yeah. thing of, wow, I won makes it a little more fun. Kind of like how when somebody likes you, they're a little more attractive. <laughs> you know? Um, what? I'm I'm not going to lie. As no, soon as no. someone said, hey, it's like, mm, yeah. I'm going to continue. Suddenly but, they get um, a second look like, yeah. I don't know, but yeah. Um, so, I mean, these are, these are kind of the things. As far as, like, catching up to the veterans, I don't think um, my personal take on that is catching up shouldn't be as important as being passionate and having fun. Absolutely agree. Okay, I mean, that is one of the things. But um, that actually kind of leads us to um, the next segment, which is separating self from character. Mm. Now, this is something Ooh. I was thinking about while watching a movie that I like despite myself. <laughs> okay. Tropic Thunder. I just watched the movie for the first time this weekend. Okay, so it's fresh in your it's mind. It's fresh in my mind. So Robert Downey Jr., right? Yeah. <laughs> That, that was he's yeah. the dude playing the dude who plays the other dude yeah that's <laughs> and yeah. in being a role player or playing these games of escapism and imagination yeah it's really easy to see yourself as the dude playing the dude who's playing the other dude you yeah. know and um and so many games I, I was in a larp for god i think it was seven or eight years mm -hmm. and there were people that were like personally ending friendships yeah. And and not liking stuff based on character A doing character, you know, doing something to character B. And it's something to be said about separation of character from person. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to start with a disclaimer. Okay? <laughs> okay. I really do. Which is, number one, you're not slick. Okay? <laughs> you're not. And this goes out to every single one of you jerkwads out there that write up jerk character so you can be mean to other players dress up as deadpool at comic book conventions so that you can yell crude stuff and try and grope people you're not that clever you're not that slick we all see you we all know you we watch you from all of our places and frankly we think you're a turd all right um so and I, I, again we've all and for those of you guys that haven't you will go through this thing of well that's what my character would do no you're just being a dick yeah okay you're just being mean so i've, I've people, played with a number of those people right and yeah. the truth is you're not that clever your friends are smart you're smart but if you're so egotistical to think that your intelligent friends don't see your very poorly worked out game ploy then you're not as intelligent as you might think 
because if we were better actors, we'd be acting for a living <laughs> and not working at tech companies <clears throat> and not doing stuff like that. So you're not that convincing. We know you're being a turd. Stop being a turd. Yeah. Stop being passive aggressive and just talk to people. Now, with that, <laughs> with that being said, um, looking at the game through the eyes of your character and doing what they would do, see, there was a reason for that, yeah. is one thing. Sure. But even when you create a character that was inspired by an aspect of your own personality, mm -hmm. that character is still fictitious. Yeah. It's not you. It's not who you are. It doesn't have your history. It has the history that you write for it. Mm -hmm. And even if you want to tell a GM that, hey, I'm playing my own history. You know, okay, you're playing yourself. Cool. Oh, you're playing yourself with the augmented powers that come with a role-playing game. Or um, I, I see this a lot when it comes to games with um, known properties like Warhammer 40k. Mm -hmm. I am a space marine and this is what I would do as a space marine. Yeah. Okay, that's great. That is what you would do. That does not mean that it will work. Right. Your preference does not equal quality. Okay? And this I'm um, this is really a big one that kind of loops back into that loss of embarrassment thing, which is your preference or your belief in a character doesn't equal that character's infallibility. Yeah. You know. And I've I've, uh, you know, like most role players, uh, I, I've certainly made many characters, like you say, that have an aspect of my personality over time. Well, it's almost impossible not to. Of course. I mean, you they say you write what you know. I mean, when you're playing a role playing game, you're playing what you know. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you there's a certain amount of what you can act outside of your own experience, but you're going to do your best role playing if you have some idea of what that role is like. So it makes sense that you would put some of yourself into that character. Um, and. A lot of times, it's how new role players uh, will start. Is you know, okay, well, uh, I don't know much about this game. I don't know about these mechanics. I don't know how to do a lot of this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make a character that's very similar to me, so that when I'm trying to figure everything out in the world, one less thing I have to worry about is what would my character do. I would just do what I would do. But then you run into that same problem, like you mentioned, of like, well, what if uh, what if you're just being an asshole and you're using the what would my character do to justify it? Language. <laughs> a butthole. <laughs> you have a two-year-old. Just get get into that mindset. She is a butthole. It's true. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it really is. Yeah. Every two-year-old. <laughs> Every two-year-old is. Uh, love her to death. Total little butthole. Um, but anyway, uh, I've played with a number of friends who also um, have really screwed around with that idea that um, well, my character would do this, and then they're just a giant dick, and then they they go out of their way to basically tank the party. Um, you know, well, my character wouldn't actually work with any of you guys. Well, okay, I get it. You made a character that doesn't want to work with anyone else. That is your right to do, but don't have that character be in a group with everyone else. <laughs> like, because as much as like, yeah, you're, you're role playing what you've written correctly. We're also playing a game and we're playing it together. And if you're making a character that does not play well with others, for whatever reason, in whatever manifestation, that's you're not playing the game right because the point of the game is to have fun. And you are anathema to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the great experiences I had lately um, is uh, my girlfriend actually has been getting into role playing games for the very first time, and um, we did. That's all right, ladies. He's <laughs> off the market. Hey. Okay, not exactly. <laughs> Well, um, cause a gamer with a girlfriend, right? <laughs> she, Hey, she may be in Canada, but I swear we make out all the time and she's super hot. That's okay. Yeah. I've got the same picture cause I bought my wallet from the same place. Oh, anyway, continue. Go. Um, uh, but I was going to say, she's been, um, really excited to start working on her own character and, uh, at, at my, uh, at my urging, she st sat down and did a lot of hard character work. Um, trying to figure out, uh, you know, again, not just what would I do in this setting, but figure out what would this character be? What would the background be? She wrote a whole history. She uh, did a bunch of research. She, like, you know, hopped online and, and did some Wikipedia stuff on, like, you know, what are the belief systems in this setting? And, like, she did a lot of the work that most new players don't bother doing. And as a result, she has a really cool, robust character. Oh, that, sorry like, about that. <laughs> 
like a cool robust character that like I'm really excited to put into games because when she's playing she's put the thought into it um, so that it's not just well this is whatever my asshole character would do like her character has some asshole traits and flaws but also is um, like they're they're not flaws that would destroy a game um, they're very flavorful they're going to they're well thought out there's nothing in there that's uh, explicitly going to ruin games for people and I feel like that's kind of the the important thing is if you're gonna play a character that is that has you know these very notable flaws mm -hmm. uh, and you're gonna try to write that off as oh well I, it's just what my character would do keep in mind that you are playing a game this is as you mentioned still fictitious this character no matter how much like you or not like you is still fictitious and the ability to sit down and actually um, make a character that can be a bad person in the game but still play well within the confines of the game is a really important part of that character creation. Um, so I, to me, that's that's a really big deal. It's it's important that you're thinking about how to mix, you know, an otherwise bad character basically. Um, into a group so that everyone can still have fun. Okay. Wow. That is some good stuff, man. That is some good stuff. Um, hang on. Let me just... Uh, but yeah. Um, what I will say on that, like I said, you ain't slick. You ain't clever. <laughs> um, but here is one of the other things I've noticed. Because um, I run a lot of things that are under... I wouldn't quite say under copyright, if you will. Okay. But they're known they're known properties by the people involved. Like I run a Dresden Files game. Mm -hmm. You want to know the lore? There are fifteen novels out, and they're right. fun as crap to read. You know, um, I run stuff based on comic books, and you know anybody can read comic books, and everyone has their favorite character. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to character, it's like, well, I look at myself pretending to be Batman. Yeah. Great. But you're not Batman. You're sure not. And the Batman that just rolled a critical failure mm -hmm. is a piece of it, it's a piece of plastic yep. on a board. You know when I'm playing the DC miniatures game, yeah. I'm like it's 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 a piece of plastic on a board. It's not you. Mm -hmm. You didn't just take a bullet from Clayface. Yeah. You know, um, and it's like, dude, personal investment based on what? And we talk about we talk a lot about the different type of gamers mm -hmm. and. You know, Wizards of the Coast did put out that thing. I didn't like that thing because every single having fun thing was based on victory. Yeah. It was all based on victory. And um, But separating yourself from the character is super duper important to do. And the question I wanted to bring up is how do we do that? Like, <laughs> what is the process? Because... When you are emotionally invested in a game, I find this in Call of Cthulhu more than any other game. When people really get into it with the lack of superpowers or magic mm -hmm. or ultra high skills and fights hurt and they mean something. By about the fourth session, um, an average, like on a scale of one to five, a two or a gamer of three or below ends up playing themselves because the game is so emotionally taxing. Yeah. And that's not a terrible thing. It, it's not. It, it means engagement. Yeah. Um, how do we separate those things? By what process? S and this is where fun comes in. Separate which two things, to be clear? The character from ourselves. Okay. What will my character do? Who is my character? Instead of accidentally playing yourself by default. Mm, okay. And... We can say it's important to do all day. But you know what we do here at BidP? What do we do here at BidP? Whenever we give a suggestion, we at least try and provide some sort of resources to do it. <laughs> you know, it drives people nuts when it's like, well, you need to find a better way. Where do I start looking? I don't know. Well, you need to find out where to, where to start looking so that you can find a better way. <laughs> find yeah. your bootstraps. Pull them. Yeah, exactly. You know, break the laws of physics and lift yourself by your feet. Yep. Yeah, go for it. Um, so one of the things that I, I definitely have us do is we look at what's going on and we're like, all right, so how are we going to stop this problem? You know, that is the big thing. Like, how do we, 
how do we stop what's happening from happening? And honestly, it's easy. Okay. Okay. And when I say easy, I mean it's simple. It's it's not exactly easy. But <laughs> yeah, world of difference between the two. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Lifting um lifting an engine block is hard, but it's simple. Yeah. Really simple. Yeah. Unscrew a few bolts, pick the thing up. Yeah. Um, but what I'm talking about here is simple, not too simple, but separating yourself from the characters um, starts with a deeper thought of who your character is and where he or she comes from. Mm-hmm. Okay, like what were their childhood like? So a good background to your characters are always good. And if it's a fictitious character that's already copywritten, like I'm going to play Mr. Miracle. You know, from Jack Kirby's Fourth World. Okay. I just got to read up on Mr. Miracle. Not a big deal. Okay, cool. Um, I'm not from Apocalypse. I'm not the crown prince of New Genesis. <laughs> I wasn't traded in war. So it's easy for me to separate myself from him. Um, however, um, what I will say is when you write your own characters or whatsoever your case might be, one of the fun things to do is speak in that character's voice. Mm-hmm. Refer to that character in the third person. Yeah. This is huge because um, when I'm playing Dungeons & Dragons, I can easily say, I check for traps. Yeah. I start preaching. I cast a spell. It's easy to get yourself confused into there real quick. But when I think in the third person, I go, my character. We'll call him... Snark Boil. Snark Boil. I love Snark yes. Boil. Snark Boil. Snark Boil the dwarf. And Snark Boil loves drinking and hitting things with his axe. However, he doesn't like hitting people with his axe. Ah. So Snark Boil hits the wall. Because, well, he's not a fighter. He's a thief. Snark Boil the dwarven thief. All right. All and right. you know how he checks for traps? Hits the wall. He knocks down the door. That's... He checks for traps. So Snark Boil knocks down the door. Now, I, the cinematic sorcerer, know that that is the wrong way to check for traps. <laughs> <laughs> that is not the way to do it. And one day the GM might catch on and kill Snark, um, yeah. Snark Block. But until that day, I can have fun being that silly. Yeah. Um, I had a character once that loved in- intimidating people by tying them up in their sleep and waking them up and covering them in butter. Okay. While, yep. while pretending that he was being told to do so by the puppet that he carried and that if he didn't do it to the character, the puppet would do it to him later. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I played a character that was held hostage by his prop. <laughs> and um, It's an interesting hook. It's not me. It's I'd, not I'd hope not. I am. <laughs> you know, I use lard, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. no. Um, yeah, it's not me. It's not a thing. Um but yeah, this is when it comes down to it, speak in the third person. Yeah. Do things to remind yourself that your character isn't who you are. Yeah. You are playing a game and the game that you're playing <laughs> is meant for fun. And when it's no longer fun, you can gracefully get up and walk away from the table. Yeah. Um so that's that's what I'm going to say on that. Did um did you have any any word any more words on that? Um, I'll I'll add a little bit to it. An important thing for me is expectation management. Um, As as with most stuff in my life, almost anything can be dealt with with better expectation management. If you're if you're going into the game, you know, we we were talking about how um, people go in saying, well, you know. I want to be Batman. I want to, mm-hmm. you know, I, Batman would never take a bullet from Clayface. Well, if you're going in with the expectation that you are comic book Batman and you go into a game where dice get involved, <laughs> you're going to have a bad time because your expectations are, are your expectations are that, um. that you are writing or that you are, you are an author <coughs> with giving plot armor to Batman. And that's simply not how that works. Yeah. That's not how the game works. Yeah. Um, but if you're going into the game, uh, they have plot armor in the book, but not on the table. Exactly. And um, I think uh, we were talking um, a little bit earlier about Warhammer. Um, you know, the idea that, like, well, a space marine in Warhammer has plenty of plot armor in the books, but oh, they yeah. just have regular armor on the table, and an anti-tank gun goes through it real good. Yeah. Um, so 
the expectation management is incredibly important, whether it's a role-playing game, a war game, a miniatures game. And one of the things I really appreciate about uh, Warhammer 40K specifically is they have a lot You're of... You're not going to sell me on this. I, I'm not trying to sell you on it. I'm just trying to say that one of the reasons I enjoy the game is that they have so many different ways to frame up expectation management. In the core book, they talk about a whole bunch of scenarios that are explicitly lopsided. And it's like, look, this is a scenario where one side loses. And we're going to tell you more than likely. It's so true. Yeah, like this is a scenario where you're going to have some outnumbered plucky defenders that are in a fortress and they're getting swarmed by aliens or whatever. Someone likes a specific <laughs> property that won't ever, ever die. It's true. Yeah. Um, but by the same token, you can look at um, if you want to recreate uh, that battle from Starship Troopers. Where you know there's they're stuck in this fortress trying to get out and there's a million bugs coming at them, and best of luck. Yeah, <laughs> but if you're going into that with the expectation that you're going to get overrun by the bugs and you're going to die, then the game is immediately reframed from how do I win to how do I have the coolest way that and how many bugs can I kill before the bastards get me? Yeah, I'm exactly. Pardon the language. Uh, you know, but you're you're now managing your expectations differently. You're reframing why you're even playing the game, and therefore you're able to have fun even if you're not objectively winning. Right. That is that is exactly the thing. Um, because I can tell you, um, as everyone who knows me knows, um, I play the crap out of Hero Clicks. <laughs> I yes, do, you do. Because I am a comic book nerd. Not a comic book nerd, but a comic book nerd. Nerds. And a lot of people, um, some of the new deckers um, that I met with last week, and we're going to be doing shows as well, um, are really, really big on Marvel. They're mm -hmm. like, oh, Marvel, 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 yeah. and Batman. And, um, <laughs> and I'm like, I follow writers because I like... Um, DC terrestrial more than I like Marvel terrestrial because I would rather live in DC's world. Yeah. But I prefer the cosmic Marvel stuff more than the DC cosmic stuff hmm. because it's got a richer history um, that I can find. Okay. And there's more books that cover outer space adventure with Marvel. Hmm. Between Silver Surfer, Quasar, Guardians of the Galaxy, Thanos, Infinity Watch, Adam Warlock. None of those books are on Earth. None. <clears throat> and I'm like, okay, I can deal with that. Um, but so, like, we got into, like, these big screw attack um, things. Like, there's no way that Dr. Fate could take out <laughs> Dr. Strange. And I'm like, here we go again. The answer is they're fiction. Yeah. They're fiction. I know you have a preference. But once stuff hits the table, yeah. once it hits the table, and as you said, when them dice start rolling, mm -hmm. anything can happen. Um, Vixen down here says um, you might end up playing year one Batman on an off night. Mm -hmm. And I've had dice nights Yep, <laughs> that are like, you know what? Yeah, Batman's got a bit of a cold and Alfred's on vacation. So <laughs> I think he had to, you know, take his own um, Thermidor. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, there's a couple of things about the moral victory and what do you do when you know you're about to lose. Yeah. But that's a different show because we've been here for a while and I've got to feed a monkey. Um, well, I will do a real quick, uh, you know, to answer that question, to uh, refer back to Clever Vixen there. Um, the, the being able to take a moral victory um, in the, uh, well, apparently we got, went, went to black there. Oh, yeah. Um, being able to take a moral victory, again, talking about expectation management, usually involves uh, trying to reframe what you're trying to get out of the game. Your camera's not on yet. Oh, so it isn't. <laughs> so, yeah. but um, Well, just trying to refra uh, reframe what you're trying to get out of the game partway through. Um, is my camera just dying on me? I'm yeah. not quite sure. Not well, quite sure. That's all right. Well, anyway, continue speaking. Um yeah, just the, the idea like, well, I'm clearly going to lose. I'm no longer trying to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat even. Jaws. Uh, you know, I just want to kill that one guy. <laughs> you know what? He's been running a train on me all game. 
And I know that killing him is not going to win. Nothing is going to get me to win. But now I have a vendetta. And if I can, if I can reframe this as being able to take him out, uh, or you know, him being maybe it's a giant robot, maybe it's a, you know a hero of the other side, maybe it's Superman, maybe you know, whatever game you're playing, whatever's going on, uh, reframing it as like, well, if I can at least do this. I would consider that a moral victory and you may not but suddenly the game becomes a lot more manageable because it's like well i lost but at least i got that one guy and um kind of looping it back around to frostgrave uh that's part of why i like frostgrave is that the campaign aspect of the game um allows that to be a more meaningful choice because well if you're if you're going to reframe the game as like well i'm going to kill that one guy and escape with two treasures instead of six um, you know, I get a little bit, I screwed that one guy, maybe he dies, maybe the other team doesn't get that, uh, that barbarian they had anymore, who was just chopping through all my dudes. Hmm. Um, maybe that's, maybe that's the case, but, uh, whatever it is, being able to kind of address and refocus what you're trying to get out of the game partway through is a really difficult skill, but a very rewarding one in my experience. I, I understand where you're coming from on that one. I, I really do. So, sorry to tell you guys that um, we're still experiencing a little bit of difficulty, but just bear with us, and for those of you guys that sat through the show, thank you. Okay? <laughs> no, seriously, seriously, they deserve their props. Yeah. Because, um, again, this is this is new. I'm we're enjoying still... being able to interact with the live chat. Yeah, this yeah, is, we're this getting fun. there. We're, yeah. we're, we're so getting there. Um, you know, we've got the GoFundMe up. I'll send a link on that, or you can go to Back in the Deck. Um, dot com and check out the website look at a few things and um we've got a fundraiser or two uh or we've got a fundraiser up so that we can afford better equipment we're about two thousand dollars out from having what we need to interact properly nice but no nice. well yeah. n nice that we have a goal that yes, is yes there is know. a goal there is a goal we're about two grand out and um we'll we'll get there we'll get there um but with what we got right now we're doing some good stuff mm -hmm. but you know, I want to thank the people in the chat. Now, once we get the website, you know, we're still bringing everything together. And there will be a live chat on the website. I'm letting you know that right now. Nice. Live chat with the signed up deckers and all that stuff. So you'll be able to, so they'll be able to tell us to go screw ourselves all the time. Um, or keep feeding us cool questions to talk about. Well, yeah, there are a couple that will do that one. Um, and if you have <laughs> any questions for real, feel free to send them to us at um well <laughs> sorry about that yeah um yeah you were saying like with the cool questions because they're coming they're most definitely coming and i'm a big fan of that but if you guys have them um like i said we are getting we're getting a whole lot of stuff together to um really do the site and do it up good so that we can get the stuff like i said we're about 500 bucks out or not 500 sorry 2000 out mm -hmm. biggest thing is the switcher yeah you know that that's that, that stuff is ugly but if you guys have any questions or comments or anything like that you guys can hit us up at um well okay sorry one of those things you guys, <laughs> again i'm getting there there we go you guys can hit us up hit us up at back in the deck at gmail.com um, where we'll answer all of your questions and you guys can give us topics to talk about because we're there as you guys know this is our YouTube channel where you can check out some of our back stock and a few upgrades and all that jazz um, follow us on the Twitter for the announcements the polls and all that and of course join us on Deckers on the book and that will be Deckers on the book because if you're one of us you are a decker sorry it's one of those things um so look for us there listen to our archives because we give all of the audio away for free download it and listen to it at your leisure if you are from southern california like we are you're going to be listening to us in the car in traffic uh, and you can download us or listen to us on the soundcloud app for right now at soundcloud slash bid p um, also find us on the Instagram or follow us on Instagram at Instagram slash back in the deck. And what I will say now is 
If anybody has tried to tell you or does try and tell you that you can't like what you like because of your circumstances of birth, be it gender politics or sexual orientation, color of your skin, religion of your family or country of origin, you just tell them to take all those cards and put them back in the deck, Mr. President. And this is Solar Gray with the Duggernaut. All right, telling you guys we will see you next week on the game gallery thank you guys very much